Hello and welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Today we will learn about a robot that is automating the ancient task of drawing out architectural floor plans on construction sites. Amazingly, this task is still done today as it has been for thousands of years by taking a piece of string covered in chalk and stretching it out on the construction site according to the floor plan and then snapping the string against the floor so that it leaves behind a line of chalk. Our interview Abate talks to Tessa Lau, the founder and CEO of Dusty Robotics, who have built a robot that solves this pain point in the construction industry and adds value that just wasn't possible before. Hey there, welcome to our podcast. Thanks for having me. Could you, uh, could you introduce yourself? Tell me a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, my name is Tessa Lau. I am the CEO and founder at Dusty Robotics. And uh, prior to Dusty, I was the CTO and co-founder at a robotics company called Savvy Oak, where we were building hotel robots, robots that would deliver room service to guests in the hotels. Now at Dusty, we are revolutionizing the construction industry by creating high precision mobile robots that take digital models and bring them out full scale onto construction sites. Yeah, and um, your background, did you come from a robotics background in academia? So I studied uh, computer science in school. I got my PhD from the University of Washington in AI uh, and intelligent user interfaces, actually software. And I didn't get into robotics until about eight or nine years ago. Uh, I had been working at IBM for about 11 years doing software automation and intelligent systems. And then I decided I wanted to do something different. And so I joined a company called Willow Garage which was basically the epicenter of robotics research, the robot operating system, ROS. And uh, I was there for the last year of Willow's existence. So uh, I came to it late in life, but uh, it's been an absolute blast working with robots. I think um, unlike software, robotics have the potential to touch the real world and move atoms, not just bits. And that's what gets me really excited about it. Awesome. And uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what you're doing at Dusty Robotics? Mm -hmm. So Dusty is on a mission to create robot powered tools for the modern construction workforce. And what that means is that we create uh, uh, essentially tools like, like powered screwdrivers or like forklifts that allow people to do their work faster, better, safer through the powers of robotic automation. So the problem that we're solving first with Dusty, with our first product, is that if you look at what's going on in the construction industry, it's one of the oldest industries in the world. Everyone, you're living in a house that was built by the construction industry. Everyone's surrounded by, by the artifacts of this industry, but it's mostly done by manual labor, by people using their hands to actually build buildings. And they follow, in some cases, very modern or very traditional archaic processes to do that. And so one of those processes is when you design the building, let's say you create, have your architect draw some floor plans, and when you actually go to build that building, what you do is you, uh, you take those floor plans, you print them on paper, and you send someone out into the field with measuring tape and a piece of string. And he crawls around on his hands and knees on this big concrete slab in order to mark out that floor plan. And that floor plan, that process is called layout. Once they do layout, that's when they can start building. So layout is this critical path task that has to be done before anything can be built on site. So that process hasn't, that was invented by the early Egyptians about 5,000 years ago. They invented this, this string, uh, you stretch it between two points and you snap it and it leaves a line of chalk dust on the floor. And that's how they mark out the location of walls. And so that process hasn't changed at all in millennia. And so Dusty is bringing modern robotics to this problem. Uh, we are leveraging the fact that buildings are getting designed completely in software these days. And we are taking the software designs of buildings and we are printing them using a, 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 a construction scale plotter, basically, to mm -hmm. draw out the locations of those floor plans on the deck. And what that lets our customers have is confidence that there's no mistakes being made. No one is making a measurement error, reading the measuring tape wrong or snapping the line in the wrong place or interpreting it incorrectly because mm -hmm. all of those errors lead to increased cost and time in the project and it creates worse outcomes for the owners. And so our system enables builders to just build correctly the first time without making any mistakes and it's saving them a lot of time and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, 
um, the current process right now is people are walking around and they've got these maps and they've got the map of the layout and what it should be. And then that's printed out from the software that they're using that has a 3D model and you know it's super sophisticated. And they're taking these paper maps and then they're trying to draw it out on the actual um, construction sites. That's right, that's right. And it's, it's a very manual process. They're basically just trying to, so imagine you're on a flat floor, there's no features, it's basically a big slab of concrete and you've got a floor plan in your hand. And your task is to draw that floor plan on the floor. And so you're starting from nothing, you have no reference points. Um, and so what you have to do is measure out uh, for each wall, figure out how far is it from the next wall over, measure that distance and then draw that line and then repeat over and over and over again. Yeah, I mean, this sounds incredibly hard. How, uh, how accurate can a person do it and how long does this take a person to do it? Is this done by a team of people or just yeah. like one person? It's typically done by a, a layout crew is usually two people and uh, each one is holding one end of the string. And uh, it usually takes, uh, it takes a significant amount of time. So on a multifamily residential project, for example, that we've been on in San Francisco, they allocate a whole week to doing the layout for maybe 20 studio apartments on a floor. And every floor has to be laid out. So all, as you go up and up the building, it's just a repetitive process of uh, continuing to do the layout for each floor as it comes up. Mm -hmm. And what type of features are they drawing? Is this just like the location of all the walls that they're gonna put in or other mm -hmm. stuff too? Mm -hmm. So pretty much everything on a construction site that gets installed has to be laid out first. Mm -hmm. So if you think about all the things that go into your building uh, for, for a standard apartment, there's not too much stuff. But if you imagine like a, a wet lab or a factory or a production line, right? And you think about all the mechanical support systems that go into place, the air handling systems, the ducts, the, the plumbing, right? All of those things need to get laid out so that they can get installed in the right place and not clash with each other. Mm -hmm. And so the walls are basically a starting point because most of these systems land inside the walls, but all of the other things that go into this into these more complex buildings, everything gets laid out. And so what Dusty is doing right now is actually with our printer, we are starting to take on what we call multi-trade layout which is looking at all of these internal systems and marking it down on the ground exactly where they're supposed to go. And that allows all of our customers to have a very clear roadmap of what they need to build where. And uh, there's no more uh, errors. There's no more arguments about who does what where. It's all just very clearly laid out. Interesting. This also makes me think of like, a, say, a manufacturing warehouse where you've got a ton of tools and you're paying per square foot and you're trying to optimize it as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And this is like post-production. The building's already there. Mm -hmm. and you're just trying to figure out the layout and location of all the machinery mm -hmm. um, that you're trying to that you're trying to put in the most optimal position. Mm -hmm. Would this also be, would that be a use case for that? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've heard on construction sites is that imagine a really complex site like an airport construction. Uh, it can cost uh, thousands of dollars per second to keep that site going. If you imagine like all of the overhead of all of the people that you have to pay to hire to keep the site operational, the electricity, the rental fees for all of the equipment. And so every second of delay costs real money in mm -hmm. terms of that, that get passed on to the owners who are actually trying to get this building built. And so the more work that can be done upfront in the design phase and the modeling phase um, and uh, the less work that needs to happen in the field, the more money you save. Because if you're in the field and you discover that you can't install your pipe there because the electrician put his wire there, then you need to stop work and someone needs to figure out that problem. And during mm -hmm. that time, money is racking up. You're, you're still continuing to pay the operational cost of keeping this project going. And so the industry is moving towards doing more digital modeling. Uh, in the instruction, it's called BIM, Building Information Modeling. Mm -hmm. And these BIM models are basically 3D pad models of all of the details of the building, including where all of those pieces, how they fit together like a jigsaw. And so if we can push more of this work to the earlier stages of the design, then we can save a lot of money in the field when the time comes to actually build. Mm. And what's the fidelity of the BIM models usually? Uh, they get modeled down to the 16th of an inch or better. Mm -hmm. And then is that the same spec that the person is doing it by hand is trying to trying to replicate? Yeah, well, to be honest, you know, reading a 16th of an inch on a tape measure is not that precise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and, and the chalk that they use, you know, the, the thickness of that chalk line is not that precise. 
what we typically see for a layout curve operating in the field is that they have a precision of about an eighth of an inch. Mm-hmm. And that's if they don't make mistakes. Mm-hmm. The, real, the real value that Dusty brings is we are printing layout exactly where it needs to be down to a 16th of an inch or better. And, and we're doing that with zero errors. Mm-hmm. And so tell me a little bit about the robot that you're building. Um, is it, what's the name of it? How does it look? Mm-hmm. So we call it a field printer. Mm-hmm. So Dusty's field printer, you can imagine a Roomba with a printer strapped to it. It's like a small, about you know one foot by two foot mobile robot, drives around autonomously on a job site and attached to its front is a, an inkjet cartridge that sprays ink down on the ground. So mm-hmm. as it's driving, it's actually printing lines just the same way your, your printer on your desktop at home uh, prints words on paper. Our system prints uh, text and lines on the floor of the construction site. Oh, text as well. So this mm-hmm. is something, is this also something that the person doing it by hand is doing? So Dusty actually does a lot more than the people who are doing it by hand do. And mm-hmm. that's because we are digitized, we are computerized. It's really easy for our system to actually print all this additional information. What we found is, <laughs> is that the people who are doing this in the field, they do the bare minimum they need to actually build. Um, mm-hmm. So if you imagine like building a wall, typically you uh, what you need to have is the, uh, in order to build that wall, you're going to lay down uh, what's called bottom track, which is basically like a, a, think of a two by four that gets laid down on the floor. And then you put studs, vertical studs, on top of that to frame out the wall, okay? And so the location of that two by four that goes down on the floor, that bottom track, the bare minimum of information you need is on one side of that track. And you need to know which, uh, so you draw one line, and then you need to know on which side of that line do you actually install the wood. And sometimes people put an X on the side that they need to install the wood on. And that is prone to error. Sometimes people mess up, they put the track on the wrong side of the line, or sometimes they put the line in the wrong place. And so what Dusty is printing is actually an order of magnitude more information than what they would typically lay out in the field. So Mm -hmm. we are printing the literal blueprints. We're printing both sides of the the track. We are printing the location of the drywall, the the gypsum board that that gets hung on the sides of the walls to make it a finished wall. Sometimes there's one layer, sometimes there's two layers of drywall. We're printing all of that information. Sometimes there's different wall types, different wall heights. Sometimes there are openings in the walls like doorways where we're noting the dimensions of the doorway so that they can all get built out correctly. And all of this additional information uh, just makes it so much easier for the crews in the field to actually build off of it because they are not uh, guessing or they're not having to interpret the information. It's just right there in front of them under the boots. Yeah, I think that actually brings me to a good point. So it sounds like what Dusty is doing is really facilitating the communication to be rock solid and not right. open for interpretation. That's right. How big of a problem is that on the work site? Every single contractor I talk to has several horror stories about layout mistakes and the impact they have on their projects. Uh, mm-hmm. In one case, we heard from a project executive that uh, they were building a multifamily uh, property and they had a problem with the toilets. Uh, there's an ADA requirement in the US that requires all toilets to be a certain distance from the wall for handicap access. And they discovered after the entire thing had been built that the toilets were not the right distance from the wall. Hmm. And that's a layout problem. You know, things were not put in the right place. And so they had to take out all the bathrooms and redo them, which was incredibly expensive. So every single contractor has a story like that. It's it's a real cost, these layout mistakes. And um, not being able to uh, being able to trust that you don't have to to worry about these problems is a huge 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 game changer for the industry Mm -hmm. and so one of the beautiful things of hiring people to do this job is that they're incredibly adaptable Mm -hmm. you know the environment's like super messy or there's something Mm -hmm. unexpected they have intuition and they can solve these problems how easy is it to pick up one of these field printers and then put it on like you know a construction site which might be and maybe you can tell me a little bit more, but just like how chaotic it could be. So uh, one of the, the cool things we've discovered as we've been deploying our robot, we've actually uh, completed, um, I actually haven't counted yet. We, we've completed a large number of production projects already. The largest one has been a 13 story building that uh, just wrapped up in San Francisco. And, and you know, we started on, on the second floor working with our client and not really, it was our first big production project. 
and they didn't really understand what the robot would do and they didn't really need to know what we needed and neither did we. And so it was a learning experience for both of us. And as we moved up the building and they saw the value of what we were bringing, that we, they saw us saving them time, saving them money and doing a much better job than the people were doing, they started accommodating us a lot better. And so by the time we got up to the fourth floor, they cleared the floor for us. And so we didn't have to wait for material to be moved out of the way. We had a, we had a process down where we'd start on this end of the floor and we'd work our way over to the other side and they'd be working ahead of us and just clearing it out in front of us so that when we are ready to move over, they have people ready to uh, clear out the site for us and just um, make things easier for the robot. And so they did, uh, they made a, a couple changes to their process to make it easier for Dusty to operate. But um, overall, because the value that we bring to the project is just so enormous, our customers are willing to work with us and actually make that happen and uh, make sure that we have the conditions that we need in order to operate. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So um, the acceptance of the people working on the site and like them understanding how much value this product is bringing is a factor in how well your product succeeds as well. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, especially with a, con with a industry as old as construction, um, I can, mm -hmm. I can see that there might be a lot of resistance to change and resistance to something that's very foreign and, you know, maybe taking someone's job mm -hmm. um, and then viewed as like, I don't know if that's viewed as negative in the construction industry, but yeah, so, how, imp how important is that, um, yeah. um, that acceptance by the customer? It's huge. Uh, so when we started and, and we, you know, we, we continue to get occasional pushback from people who are kind of traditionalists, right? They, they've always done things a certain way, especially the older people in the industry. They, they're accustomed to the way they've always done it. And they look at new technology with a very skeptical eye. So typically when we first come on site, the foreman and the superintendent, who tend to be these more traditional uh, laborers or skilled workers actually, um, they, they, they approach Dusty with like a very, very wary, you know, is it really gonna work? Is, you know, can I really trust this thing? But after, after an hour of when we're operating on site, uh, you'll typically find them smiling behind their COVID mask. They're just <laughs> super excited about what we're doing. They, they turn into believers. And the reason why is because layout is this task that's done by some of the highest paid, uh, most important people on site. It's, it's typically the foreman who has all of the experience about how things get built. And they're the only ones with enough uh, that can be trusted to do this task typically. And so those foremen, they've got a number of other things that they should be doing as well as layout, but because they're the only ones that can do it, they get assigned for a week to be crawling around on their hands and knees, getting their hands dirty doing this job. And so when they see that there can be a robot that does that job for them, and they don't have to be on their hands and knees, they don't have to be getting dirty, they love mm -hmm. it. They yeah. love it. They look at it as a tool <coughs> that basically makes their job so much easier and so much better, especially because they know that there's no possibility of error when they're using a dusty machine. And so they'll just be able to create a much better outcome for their, for their work. Yeah, that must be really liberating to know that you can just deploy this and then you're you're not held accountable for thousands of dollars of, you know, right. um, delays. That's right. I mean, no one wants to make a mistake, right? But mm -hmm. we all know that mistakes happen despite everyone's best intentions. And so it's sort of like when they rolled out, uh, you know, uh, impact drivers or, or powered screwdrivers. No one wants to go back to use a, a regular manual screwdriver anymore. It's just so much harder on the body you get a much better result, more consistent torque with an impact driver. So why go back? And it's the same with Dusty, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a power tool. It allows you to do your job a lot better and smarter, easier on the body with better outcomes. So no one is ever going to go back to doing manual layout once they just got Dusty. Mm -hmm. And would you say working in the construction industry, um, there are they a little bit slower to accept change in new technology and a little bit more suspicious than some other industries? You know, I think it's just like any other industry. There's the uh, curve, the bell curve of early adopters to late adopters. And within every industry, there's always some companies that are more on the early adopter side and some that are more on the late adopter, you know, let's, I'll, I'll use it when everyone else is using it kind of attitude. So we've been focusing on the early adopters. There are plenty of them in the construction industry. And in fact, some of the biggest general contractors in the U.S. are very interested in trying to adopt new technology right now because they recognize it's the difference between life and death to them, right? Without adopting technology, they are not going to survive into the next century. 
-hmm. And so there's a, we, we're seeing a lot of pull from the industry for solutions like ours and other construction robotics technologies, because they know that this is the only way that their industry is going to be able to meet the demands of the, the new uh, amount of building that needs to happen in the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think another thing that this sort of pushes us to as a as an industry is being able to work overnight or like work with the lights off. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Is that how Dusty's working right now? So right now we uh, we require a human operator to set up and run the system, and uh, that is something that I would love to change over time. the The idea of a lights out construction site is kind of the holy grail for everyone, right? How can we turn this chaotic human driven process into something that is fully automated that has robots going everywhere and, and doing all of the work with with a little bit of human oversight i think we are many years away from that yet but i think uh, the technology that dusty is developing is one one crucial step towards that vision mm -hmm. and so let's say you, you draw the plans out on monday right and then um the next day or let's say later that week our plans changing so quickly that um Dusty's field printer will be reprinting those lines, maybe erasing the old ones and putting out new layouts frequently. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we were on a project like that, I would say it's probably not very well managed. Uh, typically, the best projects that we're on, they finalize the designs months in advance. And they, you know, once time is ready to build, they actually have the plans in hand and they have Dusty print them and then they get built and there are no changes. Uh, but, you know, occasionally owners will ask for changes, especially now during COVID, the requirements for interior space is changing a lot. People are trying to figure out how many square feet per person, how are they going to use their interior space as, as everyone comes back to work. And so we are seeing a number of changes happen in the industry, uh, as, as the, especially like the big tech companies try to figure out what their, what their strategy is for using their space. So, you know, what Dusty does is we do the, we, we print whatever we're given. And if you need to have us come out and, and redo a portion of it, we're happy to do that. But you know that our business model is we charge based on the amount we print. And so it's up to the owner and to the general contractor to decide how best to use our services. Mm -hmm. So you're in and out of these projects. You're not hanging around from beginning to the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. We're basically a, a, a service provider, typically to, a, to the drywall subcontractor. And we're in and out to do this job. And then we move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, so I'd like to dive in a little bit into like the hardware and the software mm -hmm. stacks. Um, could you describe like all the hardware to begin with? Mm -hmm. So our system has two main parts. Um, <clears throat> we are, the, the main part that your uh, viewership will be interested in is our robot. If you go to our website, dustyrobotics.com, you can see some videos of our robot in action. And our robot is basically a little metal box about one foot by two feet, about one foot high that's uh, got two drive wheels and a, and a rear caster. And it uh, navigates autonomously on a job site uh, as it, and prints as it goes. So it has a printer on a, on a stage in the front. That printer can move left and right in order to do fine grain adjustments. And so as the robot's navigating around, it's able to deposit a line of ink or a line of text as it goes in the right place. Uh, the big question for roboticists is how does it know where it is? How does it do localization? Do you use SLAM? Do you use onboard sensors? So when we started Dusty, we actually looked into all the sensors that are available out there. Uh, coming from Savio, my co-founder Phil and I, we've, you know, we've had a lot of experience with depth cameras and LIDARs and sonars and all the things that mobile robots typically have. And the problem is that all of those sensors don't give us the accuracy we need in order to solve this problem. Our customers need us to print within a millimeter of where the line needs to go. And most of those sensors aren't capable of giving you a millimeter accuracy in localization. So we actually had to develop a new solution. And in order to develop that solution, we leveraged some equipment that's already on construction sites. So we took advantage of the fact that we are a construction tech company and people are already solving this problem on construction by using what's called a total station. Total Station, you've seen them on the roads. There are these tripods with a laser turret on top and they shoot a laser beam off to some, someone in the distance and so that someone in the distance is holding a rod and the Total Station measures the distance very precisely between the instrument and that, that reflector in the distance. Mm -hmm. And they use that to survey out roads and, and mark out uh, property boundaries and things like that. And so that Total Station is capable of measuring uh, typically down to the millimeter accuracy uh, where that reflector is. 
And so what we did was we took a total station off the shelf. We take that reflector and we mount that reflector on board our robot. And so now as our robot's driving around, it's in constant communication with this total station to get a very precise XYZ position of where it is. And that's how we know where we are. So we, do, we don't do onboard localization or SLAM. We get, a, we get an absolute reading of where we are in the site based on this external device. So do you have multiple of these stations around so you can pin yourself from like say three different tripods to get mm -hmm. your exact location in XYZ? <clears throat> so we actually only need one to give us the uh, precise location. And that's because the design of these units, the total station actually has a, it has a laser distance measure, an electronic distance measure. So it, it knows how far the beam traveled before it bounced back. And it also has two angle encoders. And so those three sensors give you an XYZ coordinate. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to triangulate across multiple units. Okay. And say there's something blocking like a wall between you and the, um, the tripod. Uh, will, is occlusion going to affect this? Yep, exactly. So our system only works with line of sight right now, uh, making it work uh, in what we call shadows. So giving it the ability to drive behind a column, for example, temporarily lose line of sight and then regain it when it comes back out. That is an open problem for us. We would love to find someone willing to work on that challenge with us. We are hiring. <laughs> nice. Um, so, and then to what are the algorithms that you're using to convert these BIM models and then mapping that out into the real world? So, um, uh, so our, our, our customers actually uh, do most of their modeling in 3D, uh, but our printer prints in 2D. And so there's an export process that has to happen, uh, typically on our client side, where they take that 3D BIM model and they turn it into 2D CAD. Uh, 2D CAD, AutoCAD is a pretty standard uh, file format, and that's what our system accepts. And so we basically take a 2D CAD file, which has basically a list of primitives in it, a number of, of lines with their coordinates, and uh, we convert that into a representation that our robot can print. What we actually do is we run an AI planner over top of that list of lines in order to create the optimal order in which to uh, print them. It's sort of like the traveling salesman problem, right? If you're trying to get from one end of the country to the other and then back, what order do you do your stops? Well, it's, it's kind of the same problem. What order do we print the lines to minimize the total amount of time taken to actually complete a job? Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the scale of time that we're talking about between the different optimizations, uh, is that like an hour difference, a few minutes? That's a, that's a really good question. We haven't actually uh, determined that. But you can kind of imagine worst case scenario, if you're on like a 20,000 square foot floor plate and you're, let's say you have a very suboptimal optimizer and uh, it chooses to do one line over here on one side of the floor and then drive all the way over to the other end of the building, print another line, and then drive all the way back and print another line. You can imagine it would be really slow versus something that uh, does sort of something more similar to a nearest neighbor approach where you print one line, figure out where you are, print the next closest line to it, print the next closest line to that. Right? So there's some really low hanging fruit, easy uh, ways to do this optimization process, but then there's a lot more sophistication that you can introduce as well to just make it even faster. Mm -hmm. So how computationally expensive is all of this? Is everything being done on the robot itself and um, not in the cloud? Yep, everything is done locally. Uh, one of the challenges of working in construction is that there's no consistent Wi-Fi. Mm. And so we can't guarantee that there's uh, any internet connectivity. We could bring our own, but, uh, but you know, 5G is expensive. So we try to do as much off the shelf as we can. And, and partly that's also because our philosophy is that we're building an appliance. You know, we're, we're building a printer. We're not building a cloud connected uh, device that needs to talk to home in order to do its job. We have to work in, uh, in basements and in places where there basically is no uh, connection to the outside world and the system has to be standalone and functional. And that's really interesting because I'd imagine that a lot of different people working there would need the Wi-Fi. Um, and then as construction industry gets more integrated with tech, um, is this a limiting factor for other technologies being implemented on mm -hmm. construction sites? We're seeing slow rollout of, uh, of both Wi-Fi and 5G on construction sites. It's not the norm at all on any site that we've been on so far. There are products that do benefit from having uh, better connectivity. Uh, for example, Plan Grid, which just got acquired by Autodesk, they pioneered the use of iPads to view plans in the field. 
-hmm. And in order to view those plans, you need some kind of a network connection. But you know, I think one of the solutions there is you just hand everyone an iPad with a with a 3G connector inside, right? And so they'll get some amount of connectivity. You can also sync in the office before you head out into the field, uh, which is not an option for Dusty. So you know, it's it's slow going. I think the industry will eventually start to adopt more connectivity. But for now, uh, if we want to uh, have a product that works in the current state of affairs, you can't rely on any any connectivity at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when I'm imagining the field printer, it sounds kind of similar to, say, the warehouse automation robots that they have that Amazon paved the way for. Uh, would it have been possible to, say, retrofit one of those robots, put some rugged wheels on it or whatever it is that you need to make it work in a construction site and then save yourself that, um, that time for developing a custom robot? Mm -hmm. So we actually uh, started with an off-the-shelf robot base. We started with a Ubiquiti Robotics a Magni base, which saved us a huge amount of time in the beginning because we could get something up and running. Uh, actually, I believe we we bought our first uh, Magni base in uh, at Robo Business uh, 2018. Uh, that was like in October or November, I think. And we had that we built a robot, a printer on top of that robot, and we had it on a customer site in January of the next year. So you know we were able to go from nothing to uh, first functioning MVP in the space of three months. And that wouldn't have been possible if we'd had to design and build everything from scratch. So yes, absolutely. I love plug and play components. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredibly fast. Yeah. Um, okay, so now you, you've got this product that's automating the marking of floors and making floor plans. Um, are there any other features that you're adding into this um, that really sell this and make it move beyond this, um, this one job task? So this one job is actually a huge market for us. Um, and I think we can go a long way just, just, just in the layout space. If you look at construction, the construction industry, it's a $2 trillion industry worldwide. And somewhere between one and 5% of the cost of a project is spent on layout. And so even 1% of $2 trillion is a huge number. And so if nothing else, if we were to just to tackle this layout problem and nothing else, Mm -hmm. There's a huge market just for that. And so right now, you know, we're still small. We have a, we have a relatively small team. We're, we're growing, we're, we're hiring. But um, with the resources that we have, we're focusing just on how do we make the best possible layout robot that we can? And within that, how can we expand to take on more and more layout tasks to increase the value to our customers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how big are you guys? And how long have you been in industry? <clears throat> we are... So we're about two and a half years old. Uh, we were founded in 2018 and our current uh, staff is 12 people. Uh, that's probably half and half field and engineering at this point. Uh, so we have a significant field team who's the one who is actually the team that's actually running our robots out in the, in the field. Uh, they are the first line between our customers and our product and they're ensuring that everything goes well. And uh, then we have a, an engineering team, of course, who is developing all of these new features and uh, building robots for us and creating more value for our customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How important was market timing for this? Are you guys the first ones to try and do this? So the interesting thing is that one of the reasons we realized this was a good idea was because one of our biggest customers, DPR Construction, they actually tried to build this 10 years, <coughs> 10 years ago and they failed. Mm -hmm. um, they had this project called Project uh, a, a laybot. Uh, there was a layout robot that used holonomic wheels and they had a pen on a gantry that would actually mark uh, lines on the floor. And I've seen some videos, they built three prototypes. And to be honest, they were never able to achieve the level of accuracy and precision and repeatability that our system was able to achieve within the first six months of our operation. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's a hard problem, but there's a huge amount of value to it in the industry, which is demonstrated by the fact that that one of these big construction companies was willing to spend, I think they spent you know millions of dollars and several years trying to bring this product to market before mm -hmm. eventually deciding that they just weren't going to be able to do it. Yeah, um, how many years ago of, was that? That was in 2010 that they started okay. that project. Mm -hmm. So you know we're not the first to try this. Uh, anecdotally, 
every other person I talked to in the construction industry has tried to do this. They've taken a pen and tried to strap it to a Roomba and tried to solve this problem. And, you know, it's, it's a hard problem to solve to get millimeter accuracy off of these mobile robots. So it's, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. It shows how like an idea can be had by multiple people, but it's the execution team that can really generate, uh, guarantee its success. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, another one of the, the differences between 2010 and 2021, um, tech has advanced a lot. And then the amount of like, uh, onboard computation that you can do yeah. has changed incredibly since then. Absolutely. And we're leveraging all of that. That, that just makes our job a lot easier and it means we can focus more on the problems that actually matter to our customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what do you see as some of the greater trends in the construction industry right now? There's definitely a trend towards more, more digitization. Uh, most of that digitization is happening in what's called the pre-construction phase. And that's the design phase during which they're modeling out the building and trying to decide what goes where, how do all the pieces fit together. And they're doing this all in software. So that is definitely happening. We're seeing more and more projects adopt BIM modeling, uh, even down to the mid-size projects. Uh, it started out with just the, the biggest, most complex like stadiums and uh, hospitals. And now we're seeing that start to happen on um, you know, mid-sized like office renovations and things like that, where they're starting to do uh, this kind of, this level of detailed modeling. So all of that is happening. And um, they're also, we're also seeing a large interest in construction robotics. So while that's happening, people are saying, well, we have all of these digital models. Why are we still depending on people using their hands in the field to assemble these buildings? Why can't we make construction more like a manufacturing floor, which is levering, leveraging robotic automation in order to make the product more consistent? Uh, and one of, the, one of the reasons it's hard to do that is because every building is essentially a one-off. Every building is different. Mm -hmm. It has a different site. It's located in a different orientation. Even if you're building multiple buildings on the same uh, property, everyone has its own, its own quirks. And so every building gets designed and built from scratch, from the ground up. You're not leveraging economies of scale and repeatability like you do on a standard uh, manufacturing floor where you can leverage a lot of automation. So it's been a challenge for the industry to adopt automation. But what we're starting to see is companies like Dusty, and there are several others like us, that are finding ways to introduce automation into this process in order to digitize it. The best example that I have, um, I'm sure you know Boston Dynamics, they build a lot of robots and one of their products is this uh, spot. Uh, it's this quadruped uh, robot shaped like a dog that can climb stairs and you know navigate rough terrain. And so construction companies are using this spot to actually do some useful work on construction sites um, and it saves them from having to, to send people out to do the same work, which in turn gives them much more predictable results. Uh, one of the applications for SPOT is to do a scan, uh, what's called a reality capture or a laser scan of the job site, which tells you what's going on, uh, how much progress has been made, is everything in the right place, and it allows you to catch problems before it's too late and when they can be more easily fixed. Um, and before SPOT, you'd have to send a person out with a, with a camera or a capturing device and you'd have to tell them, you know, walk this path, do it exactly the same way every time so that we capture the same data every day. And, you know, no one's, no one's good at that. So mm -hmm. having a, a automation tool that allows them to send a, a robotic dog out to do the same kind of data capture is, is potentially uh, saving them a lot of time and, and leading to better results there. And it's, it's closing the loop between the digital model, the site, and then back to the model, which mm -hmm. Dusty is also a part of. Yeah. How does this type of automation compare to um, these, con these construction projects that you see in China where they're building massive buildings in extremely short amounts of time? Are those automated as well? Yeah. So a lot of the technology that's going be into those kinds of projects, uh, it's, it's happening in the U.S. too, just not on as, as broadly a scale. Um, there's a lot of push towards what's called off-site manufacturing or, or prefabricated components, prefab. And uh, what that means is that instead of building everything on site, uh, bringing all the materials in, building, you know, bringing a pallet of two by fours and having people just carry them to where they go and, and nailing them into place. Um, you can actually build the walls uh, in a factory and you can build them in a factory exactly to the right shape and size and truck them to the site 
And then once they get to the site, you just drop them in place. And the building can come together really fast when you're using prefab components. Mm -hmm. So some of our customers are on the leading edge of, of investing in this technology. They're, they're starting to deploy this on their projects. They're seeing huge gains. And one of the best things is that layout becomes even more critical uh, uh, when you're using prefab. Because if you imagine that your walls are all made in the factory, they're a certain size and shape, uh, they have to get dropped exactly in the right place. Otherwise, nothing's going to fit. You're going to end up at one end of the floor. And if you had like a two inch error in the middle of the floor, you'll end up at one end of the floor and your walls are hanging off the side of the building. So everything needs to be laid out precisely in order for these prefabricated panels to actually work correctly. And so Dusty comes in into situations like that with a unique value prop that says we can lay out exactly where those walls are going to go with zero errors, a lot faster than your crews can do it. And we can ensure that this solution actually really does work and save you money in the long run. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I would have imagined if you have the prefabricated um, walls and all this other stuff that you could just, you know, in a very simplified way, think of it as Legos and just click them in at the sides. And then um, is that not how it works? Um, so they do they do click together. But the problem is that they, they're huge, right? They're, they're wall sized panels and they get lifted in via crane and dropped into position. And once they're in position, they're not moving, right? So you can't just like shift them, you know, left or right in order to make everything fit. You actually have to position them right the first time and then position everything else right after it so that the entire thing comes together correctly. Interesting, yeah. What advice would you give to people who are looking to get into the construction industry um, but they don't come from a construction background. Maybe they're like yourself where you come from a robotics background and you just find this industry very interesting. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the construction industry but I didn't know anything about it three years ago. Uh, I, the reason we got into it actually, to be honest, is that I, I just remodeled my house uh, around the same time I had left Savvy Oak and I was looking to start Dusty. And I was watching all of these people come to my, my house with hand tools on their hands and knees installing stuff and making mistakes. And I realized, yeah, if that's the way things are being done in this industry, there's gotta be a way to use robots to make it better. So my advice for anyone trying to get into construction, it's totally possible, I did it. Uh, we spent, my co-founder and I spent six months before building anything, before buying our first hardware product, before writing a single line of software. We spent six months walking job sites and talking to people. And we iterated through probably a dozen different ideas of robots we could build for that industry. And for each one, we asked people, how valuable would it be? You know, would, would you like having a robot that does this thing for you? What are the challenges? What's the value? How much would you pay for it? What would it have to do? And through that process of customer discovery, we were able to come to a very good understanding of what the pain points are in the industry, uh, who might be willing to pay for what, and where could Roboto Automation really help them? Mm -hmm. So we came up with a number of different ideas. Uh, the field printer is the best of those ideas, but we have a couple more up our sleeves mm -hmm. for when uh, the field printer is all done and we're moving on to the next product. We've got a bunch of ideas of things that can also make a huge impact. Yeah. Did you just walk up to these construction sites and be like, hey, I've got some questions for you. Listen to me. Yeah, that's one way to do it. You know, <laughs> I mean, the, the cool thing about working with construction is that everyone in construction's uh, is, is usually a, a good people person because you have to be in order to, to do this job. And so people are generally willing to talk, especially if you come in with like, you know, like I did with a, a background in robotics and something to offer, right? Um, they're, they're generally willing to make time for you and show you around their world. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get introduced to a number of project execs and project managers who were willing to show us around their project and give us some tours and explain what we were seeing. And some of those are, are still on our advisory board and still helping us uh, shape the future of our company. They've been with us since the start and they continue to believe in us. And so it's really all about finding and get connecting, getting connected to those champions early on who's going to, who are going to really help you shape your company and uh, inform the directions that you take. Awesome. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. It's been great. Uh, uh, thanks for all the questions and hope this is helpful. We hope you enjoyed listening to Tessa Lau talk about her experience building her startup. There's plenty more to discover, of course, at robohub.org forward slash podcast, including information about how you can become a patron for Robohub. As a community supported podcast, we are run by a team of volunteers from around the globe. 
And so we rely on small donations from listeners like yourself to help us keep going. So check out how you can get involved at robohub.org forward slash podcast. And we'll see you again with a brand new episode in about two weeks time. Until then, goodbye. Dusty Robotics with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics.